Okay, so welcome to everyone. And today is part three in our series of sermons, You and the Two Witnesses. And today the subtitle is The Timing of Their Testimony. The Timing of Their Testimony. So this is part three of You and the Two Witnesses. And now the subtitle is The Timing of Their Testimony. Just by way of review, very quickly, what you're going to see. The two, uh, the two witnesses are two leaders coming in the spirit of Joshua and Zerubbabel. Now, if they're two leaders, that means they also have followers. That's us. All of us have to be witnesses testifying to what the Father is doing through Yeshua to bring salvation to all of the world eventually. So that's one thing. It's also, and that was part one, as we saw in part two last week, the two witnesses are also two leaders coming in the spirit of Elijah and Moses. And then we know that Joshua the high priest is equivalent to Elijah the prophet, and they both represent what the church is doing. They represent the church. Zerubbabel, the governor, is equivalent to Moses the lawgiver. And they represent the state. So we have church and state. The religious part, the government part. Now the church points to Yeshua as high priest and savior in the kingdom of God. And the state points to Yeshua as king of kings and lord of lords in the kingdom of God. So you might ask the question, well, why is God giving us two different visions of the two witnesses? And that's a very good question. I didn't hear anybody ask that, but I assume yeah, somebody. Yeah. <laughs> so I assume that's uh, what people are asking. But anyway, why would he give a vision in one place of Joshua and Zerubbabel with the two olive trees, the two branches, all that kind of stuff? And then with another vision or picture of the two witnesses being Elijah and Moses with the fire coming down from heaven and the plagues and all that kind of stuff. Well, let's think about it for a second. Joshua and Zerubbabel, what were they doing? What was the main thing that they were doing? Does anybody remember? Joshua and Zerubbabel, what, what's their main task? What was the main question that Yahweh asked the people? Yes, Jermaine. Or he encouraged them to do something. To rebuild, the, uh, the temple. to rebuild the temple. And he said, consider your ways. Remember that? Mm -hmm. Consider your ways. Why did he have to say that? It's because there were people who were lackadaisical. It was people who we would say had the Laodicean attitude. They needed to be stirred up. They needed to be on fire for Yahweh because they were more concerned about their own homes, their own lives, whatever they were doing, than they were about building God's temple, doing God's work. So you had some prophets who came and said to Joshua and Zerubbabel and all the people, consider your way, stop what you're doing. Because every time you do something, like, you know, you go and buy something, by the time you get home, the food's dropped out of the bag and it's spoiled. Or you go and you work, you get money. By the time you get home, somebody's beating you up and taking the money from you. And you're not prospering. Consider your ways. If you put me first, seek first my kingdom and its righteousness, I will add all of those things to you. So this was a group of people who were not doing Yahweh's work. So now let's look at Moses and Elijah. So what about them? Well, it's very clear that both of them were on fire. <laughs> they were doing God's work. Elijah literally called fire down from heaven and destroyed the prophets of Baal. And Moses was able to call plagues to come, even the death of the firstborn, such that the Egyptians said, please get out of here, take all the jewelry you want, all the cows you want, just please leave and leave us in peace. So they were on fire for God. So there's two different sets because there's two different sets of people that have to have two different messages. The question is, again, which category are you in? 
Are you one who needs to hear the message of the two witnesses who come in the spirit of Moses and Elijah, who are already fired up and say, continue to do the work of the Lord day by day? Or are you in the category of Joshua and Zerubbabel, where you need to be stirred up? Consider your ways. What are you doing? Are you wasting time? Because time is definitely short. So you see what we're saying? Two different sets of manifestations of the two witnesses because there's two different groups of people that are being spoken to. Now, as we'll see today, God's two witnesses will be testifying at the same time as Satan's two witnesses. That's the whole point of today's message. God's two witnesses will be testifying at the same time as Satan's two witnesses. And of course, if they are two leaders, they also have a group of followers who will be supporting that testimony. And God will be judged as faithful and true. And Satan is going to be judged as deceitful and worthy of being thrown into the lake of fire. So God's two witnesses. And then Satan's two witnesses. Again, it's interesting. We said Elijah and Joshua, they represent the church. Moses and Zerubbabel represent the state. Well, when it comes to Satan's two witnesses, you have the beast, which represents the state government, and you have the woman riding on top of the beast. She represents the church. So Satan's two witnesses, church and state. God is going to raise up two witnesses, church and state to counteract what Satan is doing at the end time. So the two witnesses are two leaders that will testify for 42 months, which is equivalent to 1260 days, which is also equivalent to three and a half years. So in Revelation chapter 11, verses one through three, this is where we can begin to prove that this prophecy will occur at the end time. This is in Revelation chapter 11 and verses 1 through 3. Revelation chapter 11, verses 1 through 3. It says, a reed like a rod was given to me. Someone said, rise and measure God's temple and the altar and those who worship in it. That's true believers. Leave out the court, which is outside of the temple, and don't measure it, for it has been given to the nations. Now, that could be true believers, but Laodiceans. And it would definitely include people who are unconverted. So give it to the nations because the nations will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. 42 months. In verse 3, it says, I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy 1260 days clothed in sackcloth. So does 42 months equal 1,260 days, and is that three and a half years? Well, let's do a little bit of math. So maybe Seth is the most intelligent one in here <laughs> when it comes to math. <laughs> so Seth, I want you to check my math, okay? All right, 42 months times 30 days. If you have a calculator, 42 times 30 should equal 1,260. So that's 1,260 days. And then three years, if you're looking at the way God uses his calendar, it's 360 days, not 365 and a quarter days, but 360 days. So three years times 360 days, that equals 1,080 days. Plus, we have to add another half a year. So half a year, if 360 years, I mean, 360 days is one year then 180 days is a half a year. So if you add a half a year, you've got a 1,080 days is three years, and then 180 days is a half a year. So three and a half years is 1,260 days. So what we see is 42 months is 1,260 days, and also 1,260 days is three and a half years. So do we understand that part? It's three and a half years that something is gonna occur, and that's gonna be the time when the two witnesses will be prophesying. 
It is also the time when Satan's two witnesses will be prophesying, okay, and deceiving the world. So we know that it's for three and a half years. We still haven't proven that it's at the end of the age yet. <clears throat> but the three and a half years are at the end of the age. We can see that in Revelation chapter 11, and we'll read verse 7, and then we'll go down to verses 14 through 15. So this is Revelation chapter 11, verse 7, and then we'll go down to verses 14 through 15. And this, again, is proving that the three and a half years is at the end of this age. So in Revelation chapter 11, verse 7, it says, when they, the two witnesses, have finished their testimony, the beast that comes up out of the abyss will make war with them and overcome them and kill them. So who is the beast that comes up out of the abyss? It is the third revival of the Roman Empire. Of course, the first Roman Empire came up in 31 BC. It lasted to 476 AD. Then it was resurrected by Justinian in 554 AD and it fell in 1814 AD under Napoleon. Now we're waiting for the third iteration of this Roman Empire to be revived, all right? This is that beast that will come up out of the abyss and notice it will make war with the two witnesses and overcome them and kill them. And then in verse 14, it beyond the shadow of a doubt now begins to tell us this is at the end of the age because it says the second woe is past. And we're going to see when the second woe actually occurs in timeline. So the second woe is past, and the third woe is coming quickly. Another huge clue that this is happening at the end of the age, it says the seventh angel sounded, and great voices in heaven said, now who has a stronger voice than me? You remember the last time I tried to act like an angel, I was coughing all over the place. Right? <laughs> Roberto, you want to read this one? The kingdoms, of this world. <laughs> the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of the Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> that is good. Uh, Brother Roberto also knows how to blow the shofar for real. Yeah. I'm just like, eh. <laughs> and he does it for real. So thank you very much. And that's how it's going to sound. It's going to be glorious. And we know it's the seventh angel sounding. So note the beast rising from the pit. That's the revive Rome. The third woe is at the end of the age. It's right after the second woe. And the seventh angel blows the trumpet at the end of the age. And we know that Christ's second coming is at the end of the age. Okay. So now we have a chart up here. And I'm going to blow it up a little bit so that we can see the timeline. All right, so, so if we look, here's the seven seals of Revelation. So first of all, we have the four horsemen of the apocalypse, and that would be the first four seals, the white horse, the red horse, the black horse, the pale horse. Then the fifth seal is the great tribulation. And then the sixth seal is the heavenly signs. And then we have the day of the Lord, which we believe is approximately a year long. And we have the seventh seal now, and in the seventh seal, you have seven trumpets. So you have the first trumpet, the second trumpet, the third trumpet, fourth, fifth, sixth, and here's the seventh trumpet. And then notice at the bottom, it says that the second woe is past. The second woe is equivalent to the sixth trumpet. And we just saw that the second woe is past. The third woe is about to sound. And the seventh trumpet is about to sound. So we know that this is right at the very end of prophecy before Yeshua returns to this earth. And we have the return of Jesus the Christ. So if we look at this, you see where it says two and a half years. That's right at the beginning of what's called the Great Tribulation. And the Great Tribulation is going to be for three and a half years. So we know that it's going to last for another year. So if you take the Great Tribulation, two and a half years, you add another year to it, that's why it ends at the second woe. Does that make sense? You've got two and a half years, 
of the fifth seal. It continues into the sixth seal. It continues into the seventh seal for another year. So three and a half years, and it ends at the second woe. And then the third woe is about to start. Okay. So we have to ask another question. What really triggers the great tribulation? Well, you remember that in the book of Daniel, and this has to do with the 70 weeks prophecy, the 70th week is seven years. Every week is seven years. The 70th week is seven years. So the 70th week, which is seven years, is actually a covenant that the beast makes with Israel to protect it. And in the midst of that three and a half, in the midst of that seven years, which is three and a half years, this treaty is broken and the true nature of the beast and the false prophet come out. And that's what triggers the great tribulation. Now behind that, what's also going to trigger the great tribulation is the two witnesses and all of us who are alive, who have the courage to do this, who aren't lukewarm, who are on fire for the Lord. We will be standing up and saying, listen, this church, this state is false. They do not represent true Christianity. They do not represent the kingdom of God. They represent Satan, the devil. They may look like they're nice people, and they might be nice people overall, but they have demonic teachings. They're deceived, so we're not saying they're evil people. Some will be like Vladimir Putin is downright evil. Some will be like that, but others will be good, you know, as good as people get, but will be swept up like a lot of Germans were during the time of the Nazis, where a lot of Germans, they just kind of went along because they didn't want to be persecuted themselves. All right. So you're going to have us saying, this is a false system. Come out of her, my people. Now, that's very interesting. In Revelation 18, it says, come out of her, my people. Why would God say, come out of Babylon, come out of this revived Rome? That's because some of us are in it. True believers are caught up in it, are Laodicean in attitude. They're not fired up. So they need to hear that message. Consider your ways. While those, hopefully all of us in here and many, many more around the world, we will be the ones like Moses and Elijah saying, Come out of her, my people. Join us because we are teaching the truth. Not that we're any better. It's just that God's given us his spirit. And thankfully, we've been able to be humbled through many of our mistakes, realize our sins. And we say it's not by our might, by our strength, it's by God's spirit. That's how everything is accomplished. So we are just humbly submitting to you, Yahweh, Yeshua, our Father, do what you have to do through us. So it's not to say we're any better, any smarter, anything like that. But God does have chosen people. He chose people for a reason, and that is to do his work. So let us be faithful and on fire for doing his work, okay? So we have a serious job to do. Okay, so let's go back to that. All right. And again, these arrows just tell us, pointing you to the start of the three and a half years and to the end of the three and a half years. So it starts with the fifth seal, which is the Great Tribulation, and it ends at the second woe. All right, so the Great Tribulation is Satan's war against God's people living at the end of this age. The Great Tribulation that's going to be coming upon the world is really Satan's war against God's people living at the end of this age. Now we can see that in Revelation chapter 11 and verses 7 through 10. Revelation chapter 11 and verses 7 through 10. So when they, God's two witnesses, have finished their testimony, the beast that comes up out of the abyss will make war with them and overcome them and kill them. So again, this is Satan with the beast and the false prophet, the woman riding the beast. They come out and they make war with the two witnesses because they are led by Satan the devil. So it is Satan's war against God's people. 
and it's going to last for three and a half years, as we already saw. And it says, and they will overcome them and kill them. Their dead bodies will be in the street of the great city, which is Jerusalem, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, because it's very corrupt, where also their Lord was crucified. From among the peoples, tribes, languages, and nations, people will look at their dead bodies for three and a half days, which is to remind people of the three and a half years of their prophesying. But they're going to look at their dead bodies for three and a half days and will not allow their dead bodies to be laid in a tomb. Those who dwell on the earth rejoice over them and they will be glad. They will give gifts to one another because these two witnesses tormented those who dwell on the earth. So isn't that interesting? People who are teaching the truth are considered the people who are tormenting people on the earth. Well, the people on the earth, and I'm going to say it this way, need to be tormented because they have not repented. And again, that's no slight on them to say that they're evil, you know, more evil than what we were. All of us were dead in our sins and trespasses. None of us is righteous, no, not one. But they have remained because God has not chosen them. And even like with Pharaoh, when Moses went time after time after time after time again, and Pharaoh did not let God's people go, God stepped up the plagues until he got to the firstborn, right? That's the same thing we're talking about here. So they will be accusing the two witnesses and us of being the troublemakers because we're teaching the truth. And because God is going to give them, and I dare say us, signs and wonders to do to counteract the signs and wonders of the false prophet and the beast. And these things will cause people to die. And so they're going to be rejoicing, thinking that they have gained the victory. We finally shut these people up. We finally shut them down. Let's have a party, is what they're thinking. We're going to celebrate. So why will the beast kill God's two witnesses? And why are the nation, why will the nations rejoice at their death? And the answer is threefold. We already covered some, but let's go through it. Satan's two false witnesses will have deceived the whole world into believing that the two witnesses and their followers, true Christians, hopefully all of us, are the cause of all of Earth's problems, and that by eliminating us, they're doing God a favor. And if you want to see a scripture that even talks about that, the apostles, many of the disciples were killed first by the Jews, then by the Romans, because they thought they were doing God a favor. True Christians being killed. People and Yeshua himself killed. The nicest, friendliest, most generous person in the world. And they killed him. So if they killed him, what do you think they're going to do with us? Okay. So that's the number one reason why the beast will kill God's two witnesses and while the nations will rejoice at their death. The first answer is because Satan's two false witnesses will have deceived the whole world into believing that the two witnesses, God's true two witnesses, and their followers, us, the true Christians, are the cause of all of Earth's problems and that by eliminating us, they're doing God a favor. The second reason is because God's two witnesses will have killed their opponents with fire, that's Elijah, caused there to be a drought during the three and a half years of their testimony, that's Elijah, turned waters into blood, that's Moses, and caused numerous <laughs> plagues to torment the inhabitants of the earth, that's also Moses. And then the third reason is because God's two witnesses will expose Satan's two counterfeit witnesses for the deceivers that they are. So, you know, if there's a corrupt government, again, I'm going to go back to Vladimir Putin, and Alexei Navalny is a person who's in prison right now because he has stood up to Vladimir Putin. Because he's so popular, he's one of the few people who has not accidentally fallen out of a 20-story building. Many of those people who oppose this brutal dictator happen to fall out of a building. No coincidence. But so you know when wickedness is being exposed, people get upset. 
and they will come after you and they will come after us. So the war that Satan's two witnesses, the beast and the false prophet, and their followers wage against God's two witnesses and their followers, true Christians, hopefully all of us, that's spoken about in several places. So now we're about to talk about this war that has to do with the great tribulation. This is in Revelation chapter 12 now. Revelation chapter 12 and verses 13 through 17. Revelation chapter 12 and verses 13 through 17. This is having to do with describing this war. Revelation chapter 12, verses 13 through 17. When the dragon saw that he'd been thrown down to the earth, he persecuted the woman, in this case it's the true church, who had given birth to the son of man. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle so that she might fly away from the presence of the serpent into the wilderness to the place where she is taken care of for a time, times, and half a time. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. How long do you think a time, times, and half a time is? Wow. <laughs> Three and a half years. Is that a coincidence? <laughs> no, it's not. So it's talking about a group of people, the church, actually being protected from this time when the dragon is making war. So verse 15, from out of the serpent's mouth, he spewed water like a river after the woman in order to sweep her away by the flood. But the earth came to aid the woman. The earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon spewed from his mouth. And then verse 17, the dragon became enraged at the woman. You can just imagine like a dog that's got hold of something and is just trying to tear it apart. The dragon became enraged at the woman and went off to make war with who? Now, this is critical and it's chilling. This is a very chilling statement. The dragon became enraged at the woman and went off to make war with the rest of her offspring those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Yeshua. So who are these people? They're true Christians. But obviously, these are the Christians that fall under the category of the ones needing to be hearing the message, consider your ways. Consider your ways. They need to be stirred up because they're lukewarm. So God says, all of y'all who are on fire, I'm going to take you to a place, and we think it's a place of final preparation for us as we transition to become a kingdom of priests. So maybe three and a half years of being like in a university um, or taking our uh, internship. So that group is taken away. But another group of Christians, and they are Christians because they keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Yeshua, but they are taken away. I'm not taken away, but they are left behind and the dragon is able to make war against them because they need to hear the message. You are lukewarm. I counsel you to buy of me gold tried in the fire. You are naked, miserable, blind. You don't know it. Wake up. Consider your ways. Okay. But again, there will be some who are on fire or those who then become on fire who will be supporting the two witnesses. So again, because we don't like to leave stuff that's unproven, Brother Eric and a couple other people I heard said it's three and a half years, but whoever believes what Brother Eric says? <laughs> oh, that's so sweet. For y'all who didn't hear that online, his wife, Vanessa, said she does. <laughs> she... <laughs> that's good for that support. And I believe you too. <laughs> so a time equals one year, times equals two years, and a half time equals a half year. 
Together, that equals three and a half years. We're going to see two other places in the book of Revelations where this three and a half year period is mentioned. So this is in Revelation chapter 12, verse 14. Revelation chapter 12, verse 14. And we already read this, but two wings of the great eagle were given to the woman that she might fly into the wilderness to her place so that she might be nourished for a time and times and a half a time from the face of the serpent. Then in Revelation 12, verse six, we're going back, says the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by the most high that there they may nourish her 1,260 days. So again, one time is 360 days, two times, because you multiply 360 times two, that's 720, and a half a time, if you take one time is 360, half of that is 180. So a half a time is 180. So if you add 360, 720, 180, that's 1,260 days. So 1,260 days is equal to a time times and a half a time. That's one place where we see that. Now here's the second place. This is in Daniel chapter 12, verses one through seven. Daniel chapter 12, verses one through seven. This is all having to do with proving that the two witnesses will be prophesying for three and a half years at the same time that the great tribulation is going on and Satan's two witnesses will be prophesying as well. So Daniel chapter 12 now, verses 1 through 7. At that time, Michael will stand up. And we know Michael is, well, I can't say we know 100%. He is an archangel. We don't know if he's one of the covering cherubim. There's debate about that. But anyway, Michael, one of the fighting angels. Gabriel is the messenger, chief messenger angel. Michael is the chief fighting angel. At that time, Michael will stand up, the great prince who stands for the children of your people, and there will be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. So this is going to be a unique time, a time of trouble such as never was. Now, there's been some tumultuous times in the world. You ask the Ukrainians right now, and they will tell you it's a tumultuous time. Of course, our people have gone through tumultuous times, really tumultuous times, slavery, and even still to this day, lots of people being attacked by cops, by white supremacists, et cetera, et cetera. But it says, this is going to be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. At that time, your people will be delivered. So this is Michael talking to Daniel. He's saying, at that time, your people will be delivered. Everyone who is found written in the book. And we can say, thank you, hallelujah. We praise you for giving us that confirmation and that comfort that we will be delivered. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise will shine as the brightness of the expanse. Those who turn many to righteousness will shine as the stars forever and ever. Come out of her, my people. Consider your ways, those of us who will be preaching the gospel. Let my people go, those of us who will be preaching the gospel. Don't come to me with this nonsense, or I will call fire down from heaven. We will be preaching the gospel, turning many to righteousness. Those of us who are engaged in our Father's work will turn many to righteousness, and he promises that we will shine as the stars for forever and ever. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even until when? What does it say? Even until, and this is in verse four, even until the time of the end. So this is a prophecy for the time of the end. And we've just been showing also from the book of Revelation that after the second woe is passed, which ends the three and a half years, then you have the third woe. And that's during the 
seventh trumpet. So we know it's at the time of the end. Same thing that this is prophesying about. Many will run back and forth and knowledge will be increased. This is called, interestingly, the information age. That's very interesting. Then I, Daniel, looked and behold, two others stood, one on the river bank and on this side and other on the river bank on that side. And one said to the man clothed in linen, who is above the waters of the river, how long will it be to the end of these wonders? I heard the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river when he held up his right hand and his left hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever that it will be for a time and times and a half time. And when they have finished breaking in pieces the power of the holy people, all these things will be for finish, will be fulfilled, finished. So I just came up with a new word, full, full finished. <laughs> yeah, full finished. That's a new word. Okay. So again, when they have finished breaking in pieces the power of the holy people, the two witnesses will be killed, right? The beast, the false prophet, their followers will make war against them and will kill them. That's a part of what we're talking about here. And many other true believers will be killed. Many other true believers will be killed. But after that, God says, I'm going to wrap things up because God will intervene. And that's in part called the day of the Lord. Now, um, for reference sake, the time of trouble such as never was that we see spoken of in Daniel 12, verse 1 here. This is the same time Yeshua spoke of in Matthew 24, verse 21. If you want to look that up, that's Matthew chapter 24, verse 21. And there it says, for then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. So it's talking about the same time. And if you look at the context of Matthew chapter 24, the fifth um, seal there is the great tribulation. All right. Okay, so let's go on. We're almost finished here. So notice how Satan's two witnesses at the end of this age are described, and notice how their message is described. We know what our message is going to be. Let's notice how they're described and what their message is going to be. This is in Revelation chapter 17 and verses 1 through 5. So, so far, we've proven that the two witnesses will be prophesying for three and a half years at the end of the age. That's going to be time of the great tribulation, the same time that Satan's two false witnesses will be prophesying. We know what the ministry and the message of the God's two witnesses will be. So now we're taking notice of Satan's two witnesses, how they're described and what their message is going to be. This is in Revelation chapter 17, verses 1 through 5. So it says, one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and spoke with me, saying, come here. I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute who sits on many waters with whom the kings of the earth committed sexual immorality. So here we have it. The beast, which is the kings of the earth and the false prophet or the woman sitting on top of the beast, which is the great prostitute. That's how they are described. And they are described as committing sexual immorality and idolatry because this woman who's riding the beast is controlling things. That means the spiritual teaching is coming from this woman. And we know that from scripture, this is primarily the Roman Catholic Church along with the Protestants who came out of her in protest, but only a part of the way. They rejected Mary worship. They rejected um, paying indulgences to get out of hell, and they rejected a couple other things. But they held on to a lot of other traditions of men, like worshiping on Sunday instead of the Sabbath, stupid things like Christmas and Easter, which have nothing to do with Yeshua. So anyway, that's what the Bible describes. She's a great prostitute, and we're going to see a little bit later. She is the mother of other prostitutes. Those prostitutes who are her daughters are the ones who came out of the mother. The mother church is the Catholic church. The ones who came out of her who are the daughters are 
the Protestant churches, the ones who came out in protest. That's God revealing it to us. So don't shoot me. Well, if you're one of if you're on Satan's side, you can shoot me. <laughs> but I don't think anybody in here is. So one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and spoke with me saying, come here, I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute who sits on many waters, which means many nations, with whom the kings of the earth committed sexual immorality and those who dwell on the earth were made drunken with the wine of her sexual immorality. It's again, like people are drunk, they're out of their minds because they're deceived. Again, please understand, I'm not trying to criticize anybody put anybody down. All of us were in that same state at one point. God simply awakened us. He quickened us from the dead. He gave us light instead of darkness, and we thank him for it. Now we have to serve him humbly, faithfully, boldly. So verse three, he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness. I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet colored beast, which is what we have pictured here full of blasphemous names. So that's their message, is blasphemy. The beast and the false prophet are going to be pointing to a false god, namely that the false prophet, you know, is the true Messiah, and that the beast power has ushered in the kingdom of God. That's why it's church and state. It's going to be a false religious leader representing the church where people is going to think that's the Messiah. And then the government, people are going to think that's the kingdom of God that's finally brought peace, peace to the earth when there is no peace. You remember that scripture. And there's going to be a lot of prosperity also at that time. So people will be deceived. They'll be drunk by the message and the mixture. It's like, well, wait a minute. All of these kings are following what the beast power is saying and what this false prophet is saying. It can't be bad. It can't be bad. Look at the prosperity. Look at the peace we finally have around the world. And we got troublemakers saying, this is not real peace. These are false people. They're going to want to get rid of us. Okay. But they are full of blasphemy. That's their message. They're full of blasphemous names, having seven heads and 10 horns. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the impurities of the sexual immorality of the earth. And on her forehead, a name was written. Now, on her forehead, a name was written. Is it King of Kings and Lord of Lords? No. It is Mystery Babylon the Great the mother of prostitutes or harlots, and the mother of the abominations of the earth. So a mother is someone who gives birth to something, right? Who has given birth to false Christianity? It is the Catholic Church. That's documented. First, really under, now this was not the Catholic Church, but the first ones to really turn astray with Simon Magus in the Bible, that's in the book of Acts. But by the time of the first Pope, Pope Leo, that was the Catholic Church. And of course, even before then, there was Constantine, the head of the Roman Empire, who started to lead people astray, going from biblical Christianity to traditional Christianity. And we know what God says about traditional Christianity. In vain they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men the traditions of men, okay? So these are some harsh words, but we need to understand this and we need to be in full agreement with this because this is the message that we need to be speaking. It has to be crystal clear. We understand who the true Messiah is and we are pointing to him. We understand who the false Messiah is and we are pointing to him as well, making a clear delineation because we are supposed to be the light of the world, right? Turning many to righteousness, shining as the stars in heaven. So gird up your loins, because if we're alive at the time, and if we are called upon to support the two witnesses, then there's going to be some serious stuff. And even now, we, the more we step out and preach the gospel, the more persecution we're going to come against. 
So here's proof that the preceding verses speak of the end of this age. We're back to the end of the age. In Revelation 17, verse 6 through 7, and then the first part of verse 9. Revelation chapter 17, verses 6 through 7, then the first part of verse 9. So in Revelation chapter 17, verse 6, it says, I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints. Again, many of the true saints will be martyred. And with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. When I saw her, I wondered with great amazement. The angel said to me, why do you wonder? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. Here's the mind that has wisdom. And we covered that in a series of programs, identifying who is the beast. Now in Revelation chapter 17, the rest of the verse, which is uh, verse 9. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits that identifies Rome. The 10 horns that you saw are 10 kings who have received no kingdom as of yet. So when this was prophesied, these 10 kings had not arisen yet, okay? But they will receive authority as kings with the beast for one hour, a short period of time. When will this happen? Verse 14 tells us. These will make war against the lamb and the lamb will overcome them for he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And those who are with him are called chosen and faithful. When will this be? Say it louder. At the end of the age. We're talking about when Yeshua is coming back as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And it's when we are resurrected, right? And then we come back with him and it says that those who are with him are the chosen and faithful. That's us. We come back with him as he's descending from heaven and we are descending with him after we have been resurrected and we get married to him. Then we come back to establish the kingdom of God on the face of the earth. Okay, so we know that's at the end of time that this is talking about, where this beast system has arisen again for the third time. So in addition to the beast system being called the woman riding on the beast, we see another description in Revelation 19. So in Revelation 19, verses 1 through 2. This is Revelation chapter 19, verses 1 through 2. After these things, I heard something like a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation, power, and glory belong to our God. For true and righteous are his judgments. For he has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with sexual immorality, and he has avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. So we saw not only is she the woman riding the beast, but she's also again called the great prostitute. That was Revelation 19. Verses 1 through 2. Now let's read verse 11, Revelation 19, verse 11, 14, and 16. Verses 11, 14, and 16. I saw the heaven open, and I saw a white horse, and he who sat on it is called faithful and true. In righteousness, he judges and makes war. He is making war against these ten kings, these ten horns, who are fighting against him. And the armies, now in verse 14, the armies which are in heaven followed him on white horses, clothed in white, pure, fine linen. And if you read the context, that shows that's us. So in this picture, that's Yeshua coming back and us following him in white linen, coming to do battle against the beast and the false prophet and the 10 kings and all of the people who are just recalcitrant, who have not repented. And this will be what breaks the camel's back. Just like the destruction or the death of the firstborn in Egypt, this is what's going to cause people to give up and say, hey, there's a new sheriff in town. We are ready to listen. When Yeshua comes back with us and we wage war, that's going to be something to behold. And people will finally bow down and say, just like the scripture says, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Yeshua is Lord, people will begin to do that at his second coming when he establishes the kingdom. And verse 16, he has on his garment 
and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Revelation 19, now verses 19 through 20. Revelation chapter 19, verses 19 through 20. I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. All of this is tying together. I'm not making this stuff up. All of this is tying together. The 10 kings, the nations of the earth, gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. And what happens? Verse 20, the beast was taken and with him the false prophet who worked the signs in his sight with which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshiped his image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. Now that's a merciful, loving creator who hates the death of the wicked. He takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked, yet he causes them to die by being thrown into the lake of fire, which is the second death. Okay, so all true Christians are eagerly awaiting the second coming of our Savior and Lord because we know that he will establish the kingdom of God over all the earth and that he will reign as king of kings and priests of priests. But before that, the kingdom of darkness will bring deception, death, and destruction, the likes of which the world has never seen before. Are you earnestly preparing for that time? And I'm also going to say this. Are you earnestly preparing your children for this time? Are you teaching your children about these prophecies? Or are you allowing them potentially to go into these very dark times without knowing these truths? So even if you're not alive when this happens, it's almost guaranteed that your children will be, because we are living at the end of the age. There's lots of signs that point to that. Or your nieces and nephews, or your little cousins, whatever. Please learn this and teach it, and eventually preach it. Are you earnestly preparing for that time? If not, here is a chilling warning from our just God. This is in 2 Thessalonians, and I think this is the last scripture, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Now, those of us who attended worship services in the Worldwide Church of God, we know what this is like, what we're about to describe, a great falling away because of deception. All right. We had a foretaste of it, but there's going to be a much greater one because that was having to do with the Worldwide Church of God. This is going to have to do with a lot more people than the Worldwide Church of God. So 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Brothers and sisters, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus the Christ, Yeshua the Messiah, and our gathering together to him in our resurrection, the first resurrection, the resurrection to eternal life, we beseech you that you should not be shaken in mind or trouble, neither by spirit nor by word or letter purporting to be from us, claiming that the day of the Lord has come. Why is this a warning? Because Satan's two witnesses will be saying, that God's kingdom is here on earth and that the false prophet is actually the true prophet, that he is actually the Messiah. Don't be deceived by that. And they're going to be doing miracles and it's going to be hard to resist. But don't be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word or letter purporting to be from us, claiming that the day of the Lord has come. We saw that chart, the sequence of events. We know what time it is. Keep your watches synchronized to God's watch and know what time it is. Verse three, let not anyone deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come unless there first come a falling away and the man of sin be revealed, which is this false prophet, the son of ruin, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshiped so that he sits as though he was God in the temple of God, claiming to be God. Now, when it says sitting in the temple of God, this can be taken two ways, sitting in the temple in Jerusalem, which we believe will be rebuilt. But it also 
could mean sitting right in the body of Christ because we are called the temple. And that's exactly what happened in the Worldwide Church of God. Mr. Armstrong, who is not perfect, but who God used to lead many people to a knowledge of the truth, he died. And then a man of sin rose up, Joseph Tkach Sr. And then his son rose up after that, Joseph Tkach Jr. And they were revealed as who they were, and they are called, and could be appropriately called, the sons of ruin, who oppose and exalt himself above all that is called God or that is worshiped so that he sits as God in the temple of God claiming to be God. Do you not remember that I told you these things when I was still with you? And when it talks about, let me pause again for a second, mm -hmm. sitting in the temple of God, claiming to be God, claiming that the Sabbath is no longer in effect, that it never was really a part of the new covenant. That's what Joseph Scott Sr. taught. We're getting away with the Sabbath, right? That is a person acting as God, changing God's law. Who can do that? No one. But he deceived many people, and his followers deceived many people. And I'm telling you, to this day, it still amazes me that we were sitting in congregations with people who had been worshiping for 30, 40, 50 years, and they turned astray in 30, 40, 50 days of hearing nonsense. Absolutely amazing. Satan is powerful, and his demons are powerful. So we got to be on our P's and Q's, whatever that means. I have no idea where that came from. <laughs> that might be some tradition of men that I shouldn't be talking about. <laughs> anyway, do you not remember that I told you these things when I was still with you? And now you know that what holds back for him to be revealed in his own time, for the mystery of lawlessness is already working, only he is now holding back until it comes out of the mist and then the lawless one will be revealed whom Adonai shall consume with the breath of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Talking about the same exact period of time when the beast and the false prophet are thrown into the lake of fire. Now here's the chilling part that I was talking about. Whose coming is according to the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceit of unrighteousness in those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth so that they might be saved. And for this cause, not because God is a masochist and wants to hurt people, but for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, so that all those who do not believe the truth but delight in unrighteousness might be condemned. That is chilling. If you don't study this, understand it, come to believe it, teach it, and preach it, you could be in danger of falling into this category. Now, I hope that is none of us. So watch a little clip. You see, in the book of Revelation, chapter 11, it says that right before Jesus returns, God will give power to his two witnesses. And it describes this vision that God gives John about them. John writes about how one day these powerful witnesses will come and they are not going to just preach the gospel. No, they will be given power that will give evidence to the world that Jesus is king and he's coming back. The book of Revelation says that these two great prophets or witnesses will have fire that comes from their mouths. They will have the power to stop the rain and will even be given miraculous power to even cause plagues to fall upon those who refuse to listen. It says that for three and a half years they will be doing miracles to basically prove to the world who Jesus is before he returns. Basically, the miraculous stories that we've all read about in the Bible will one day be visible again right before our very eyes. So what the Bible says about the two witnesses is extremely powerful, it's exciting, it's so important. The power of God is going to be on the scene, going viral, so 
why on earth don't we hear many sermons and messages about the two witnesses? Well, that's a good question. But again, today you have heard a third in a four-part series of messages about the two witnesses.